Um, to make sure you're seeing the speaker that uh, you should be seeing, uh, you can put your settings on speaker view instead of gallery view. I'm sure all of you are, are aware of, of this, um, but if you are not, it's in the, the little button is in the top right hand corner of the screen and you just click it and click on speaker view and then you'll be seeing all the relevant uh, information. Um, we're going to have a Q&A session afterwards after, uh, after we uh, finish the talk and um, We'll open up open it up for discussion. So if you have a question, um, you can either raise your hand or just put it in the chat, um, and or just let us know that you want to uh, speak in person. So you can um, ask to be unmuted and ask your question in person, or you can just write it down in the chat, and then we will um, pass it along to to uh, Carla. Um, I hope that is clear. I'll go over this at the end as well. Um, okay, I'm just going to stop this. Screen share for a second. Go back to you. Wow, hello everyone. It's great to see so many people. Um, Tanshi Kiawao, welcome everyone. Today we gather virtually together from many different places, from overseas, um, from across the country, continent, and some right here in Winnipeg. And it is a gift for us to be together in this way. Winnipeg is located on Treaty One territory. Treaty One was signed only 24 years before Dalnavert Museum, Dalnavert the building, was built in 1895. This area of Turtle Island is the original land of the Anishinaabe Cree, Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota peoples, and is the homeland of a nation that I am a proud member of, the Métis Nation. This first is the first installment of the Elizabeth Alloway Lecture Series. Dalnavert Museum is honored to host this series in collaboration with the Winnipeg Foundation Centennial Institute and in celebration of Elizabeth Alloway. If you don't know who Elizabeth Alloway was or is, don't worry, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her before we get started. The Alloway, both Elizabeth and her husband, William, were instrumental in starting and establishing the Winnipeg Foundation in 1921. When Elizabeth died in 1926, she left her entire estate to the Fags Foundation with over $800,000. She was deeply interested and committed to charitable work, especially when it came to the welfare of children and women and was interested in the career of nursing. She was an excellent host and lived just down the street from her friends McDonald uh, and down the at which uh, a place they called the Dairies on Assiniboine Avenue. The Alloways were avid travelers and traveled extensively throughout the United States, the Caribbean, and, and Europe. In fact, they were able to go on an around the world trip before the First World War broke out in 1914. So I feel that we've come full circle back to the lecture series with our first talk with a connection to travel that I think Elizabeth Alloway would be very interested in attending. Um, this is with Robert Lewis and Robert, I mean, Robert Lewis Stevenson, Photography and the Pacific with Dr. Carla Manfredi, who is an associate professor at the University of Winnipeg and has written a book which looks at photography's role during Stevenson's travels throughout the Pacific Island region. And that book is called Pacific Impressions, Travel and Photography, 1888 to 1894. Um, so without further ado, welcome, Carla. I need myself, hi. Uh, thank you, Charlene. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Um, it's so wonderful that um, such a high high turnout uh, has been made possible on this Sunday afternoon. And uh, in Winnipeg, we're um, experiencing some very balmy weather. Um, so. I'm grateful that so many of you have chosen to stay indoors today instead of um, enjoying the good weather. So um, I'm going to get started. Uh, my presentation today is entitled Robert Louis Stevenson, Writer and Photographer in the Pacific. And I'm going to begin um, by... Just give me one second. Um, don't, okay, 
uh, by introducing uh, Stevenson to you. So R.L. Stevenson was born in Edinburgh, the Scottish capital, on the 13th of November, uh, 1850, into a very well-respected family of lighthouse and harbor engineers. His early years were marked by illness, and a solitary existence, uh, which provided him with opportunities to engage his precocious imagination and uh, to focus on imaginative adventures in which he could escape the restraints of his ill health. It was expected that Stevenson would enter into the family business and graduate as an engineer, which he briefly studied at the University of Edinburgh. However, he did abandon engineering for law um, and was called to the Scottish Bar as an advocate in 1875. Stevenson never actually practiced law and much to his father's chagrin, announced that he wanted to be a writer. He was 21 years old when he began to write essays and travel tales and soon became well regarded as a writer of talent. Treasure Island was serialized and published in volume form in 1883. Although it is now considered a central text, Treasure Island did not bring Stevenson immediate popularity. That came in 1886, three years later, the year both Kidnapped and The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde were published to critical acclaim. Until rather uh, recently, Treasure Island, Kidnapped, and Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde were novels upon which Stevenson's reputation rested and which accounted for his being pigeonholed um, as a writer of, or merely as a writer of children's adventure fiction. Uh, more recently, current critical opinion views these texts as just as, as more than just adventure writing, emphasizing the importance of colonialism and dualities as some of the central themes. Kidnapped was published to an enthusiastic reception, but the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde uh, undoubtedly became a major bestseller, establishing Stevenson's reputation both in Britain and in the United States. In 1888, Stevenson's American publishers commissioned a book on the Pacific Islands, <clears throat> or at least on Stevenson's travels throughout the Pacific Island region. In 1888, in June of that year, the family sailed from San Francisco Harbor um, on the yacht Costco and made their way for the island group, the Marquesas, followed by the Paumotu, Tahiti, Tahiti and finally Hawaii. The Stevens undertook a further voyage on the schooner equator to the Gilbert Islands and then to Samoa, where they found the gentler climate conducive to Stevenson's pulmonary complaints. Stevenson and uh, his wife and um, stepchildren settled on the Samoan island of Upalu in 1889 and built um, a plantation estate which they called Vilema, where they lived until the author's death in 1894. As a young boy, Stevenson had a well-stocked library of travel books, an extremely popular genre of literature during the Victorian period. These books were, of course, mostly written by Europeans during the time of colonial expansion and often reflected imperialist aspirations. Indeed, they were highly conventional in their romantic, representations of killer sharks and headhunters. Stevenson's literary introduction to the Pacific consisted mainly of tales of adventures where the intrepid, intrepid traveler encountered pirates and rogues, beautiful, erotic, yet childlike maidens, evil missionaries, and natives who were friendly one minute, then treacherous the next. Obviously, Treasure Island from 1883 would one day occupy a privileged place within this literary tradition of adventure writing. Although it is worth noting that later on in his career, Stevenson would go on to stress that the enormously popular story of Jim Hawkins did not take place in the Pacific. In 
in the South Seas, which is um, the text that I have worked the, the most closely with over the past uh, few years, and which is the most pertinent to this talk, was published uh, posthumously two years after Stevenson's death. It was published in 1896. Um, and in the posthumous in the South Seas, Stevenson gathers his impressions of the islands uh, of the Pacific, which he visited during his travels. Now, Stevenson had intended for In the South Seas to be a definitive history, anthropology, repository of information uh, and folklore about the Pacific Islands. In the South Seas was not the title which Stevenson himself gave to the text. Um, he would refer to this unfinished work as uh, the South Seas. And on this slide here, uh, which is from a personal letter that is dated the 2nd of December, 1889, Stevenson um, is writing to his uh, editor and close friend. Um, he's writing from the Pacific. And in this letter, he notes that such wild stories, such beautiful scenes, um, such intimacy, such manners and traditions, so incredible, a mixture of the beautiful and horrible, the savage and civilized, I propose to call the book The South Seas. Now, The South Seas um, did not live up to the author's original expectation. Uh, financially overcommitted as a result of the purchase of his Samoan estate, Stevenson was under pressure to continue to publish to meet his increasing expenses and the South Seas, later called in the South Seas, suffered greatly as a result. Um, uh, large portions of in the South Seas were published serially um, in both in the United States and in Britain in newspapers. And so um, Stevenson's readers were able um, to sort of to, to read portions of what was intended to become the final text. Some of the most um, sort of famously scathing um, early uh, reviews, I suppose, of what Stevenson was, uh, was writing came from uh, his correspondent, uh, Henry James, who noted to Stevenson that the Pacific made him descriptively serious and even rather dry. Uh, so here Henry James is responding largely to Stevenson's attempts um, at writing history and anthropology of, um, of the Pacific Islands that he was visiting. And James was noting that um, perhaps Stevenson was, uh, was adopting a style that was a little dry and dull. The famous Oscar Wilde also noted that um, Stevenson kind of in the Pacific went in an opposite direction than what would have been expected. He noted that I see that romantic surroundings are the worst possible surround are the worst surroundings possible for a romantic writer. So Wilde noting that um, once he was actually in supposedly romantic, the romantic and exotic surroundings of the islands, Stevenson, um, instead of utilizing uh, the potential of the romantic surroundings, again, just turned to dry anthropology, which was, of course, um, <laughs> his, uh, his point. So I'm going to turn now to uh, the real focus of my talk, um, and the focus of uh, much of my research uh, until recently, until the, up until now. And that is um, the collection of photographs that Stevenson and his family produced during their travels and settlement in the Pacific Islands. Um, I first began looking at these photograph albums which are located in Edinburgh um, in a local museum called the Writers Museum um, during my time as a doctoral student. Um, 
the Writers Museum is a museum that is devoted to Scotland's three national authors, uh, Robert Burns, Sir Walter Scott, and Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, the collection of photographs here, these four are a collection that consists of four albums. Um, this is one of them, as you can see, uh, the worn binding. You can also see uh, an example of the types of boxes in which they're, they're kept right behind that album. These are extremely delicate objects. Um, they not only were, the albums were not only compiled, of course, um, in Samoa, largely, um, they would have been traveled a great deal uh, to find their way back probably to California um, with Stevenson's widow and stepchildren, and then made their way back again um, to Scotland. Each of the albums is devoted uh, to one of the three cruises that Stevenson took in the Pacific. And the fourth album is largely devoted um, to the Samoan estate of Vilema. Um, that's how um, they're organized. Uh, so this album here that you have in front of you, as you can see the Front cover is embossed, Cruise of the Equator. Uh, this is the only of the only one of the four albums that actually has an embossed uh, title on it. It's also the largest of the four albums. It's the one that contains um, the most photographs. Um, now, um, I'm just going to sort of go through a couple of my personal images of these albums that I took um, as I was working with them so that you can get a sense of what uh, they look like as archival objects um, that have to be handled very carefully and that are conserved um, under very special um, circumstances. So these, this is just this cruise of the equator album from different angles. And now um, we get to the exciting <laughs> part, which is of course, uh, getting to open up the albums and um, to begin exploring them. So um, when I first did this um, as a graduate student, I was of course uh, extremely excited. I had waited um, several years to be able to make this trip um, to Scotland and, um, and to actually um, handle these albums um, was, was very special. It was also um, quickly became a very <laughs> overwhelming task. Um, so you can see that based on these first initial pages that the photographs um, appear to look quite different from photographs that you might imagine. So um, the first couple pages of the Equator album um, contain images that were made with Stevenson's stepson's camera. So Stevenson's stepson, who was named Lloyd, Lloyd Osborne, uh, began the travels to the Pacific uh, with what was known as a buttonhole camera, um, also sometimes referred to as a detective camera. It was a small uh, camera that could be, uh, that was very good for traveling with because it was small, portable, um, and it produced very small images. So these are probably about this, the size, the size of a metal, roughly, at least the smaller ones. Um, and you can see that the, the title um, at the top of the page indicates the location of the Marquesas Islands. So these are uh, photographs that were taken um, during Stevenson's first landing uh, in the Marquesas. So they reached the Marquesas right as the, that was the first island group reached um, after the departure from San Francisco. So the first few pages of this album um, are devoted to 
Lloyd's uh, buttonhole camera images. Very, uh, very quickly after this initial landing, um, Lloyd actually dropped the camera into the ocean uh, and it was not retrieved. And so unfortunately, um, these are the only images that we have um, made with Lloyd's camera. You can see that uh, these photographs are in uh, pretty rough shape. Um, by and large, the images are very difficult to actually make out, but here we have a couple that I've tried to blow up for you um, where you can sort of make out what is being uh, photographed and of course being able to read the caption um, helps as well. So in this particular instance, uh, this is a series of, of these buttonhole camera images that were taken um, upon the deck of the Costco when uh, Marquesan, a group of Marquesan Islanders um, greeted Stevenson and the other travelers by coming aboard um, and meeting with them. Uh, and this particular gentleman here um, is, uh, according to the, uh, to the caption, just quote, describing the pain of tattooing. Um, so Marquesans were known for their uh, very elaborate um, tattoos, which also uh, were often facial tattoos. And uh, presumably um, that is what is being uh, discussed. Very often with these photographs, we can find um, literary accounts that Stevenson writes about either in his letters, his diaries, or uh, that were printed in the in the South Seas text. So very often we can find photographs that correspond with a written account. And of course that really um, helps us to interpret the circumstances um, of individual photographs. Uh, here we have another selection. Um, these seem to be mainly of Anaho Bay. Anaho Bay is where is the, the harbor that the Costco landed at. Um, these are extremely faint and blurred out, but something that is quite intriguing aside from the numbering, uh, which I spend a lot of time trying to understand how they were numbered or why they would have been numbered, um, is the pencil uh, outline around number six, seven, and eight. One thing that I'm going to um, talk about in a couple minutes is the marginalia or the annotations uh, that we can find in these albums and what kind of information they may give us. Um, so here we have just another sampling uh, of these buttonhole images. As you can see as well on, on these, um, these were photographs that were um, hand cut. Um, number six in particular is quite striking um, since almost half of the photograph has been cut off. Uh, these particular images uh, seem to have been taken on land, not on the Costco. And one of the bottom ones I think it's number nine is captioned captioned uh, regulars baby and number and those those two at the bottom uh, represent a small uh, infant. Regular we know was uh, an, uh, either an American or a European I don't quite remember a merchant trader who during Stevenson's visit was living uh, with his family on this particular island. So now um, I'm going to show you some samples of Stevenson's annotations or little marginal notes that you can find scattered throughout these four albums. Um, not only do these notes give us 
just more information about the photographs in terms of uh, location. So for example, here he's noted from Apia to Vilema. So um, in terms of, okay, so this is a photograph that um, is of a landscape, particularly a kind of a road leading from the main <clears throat> town settlement on the island of Ukulo, Ukulu to uh, the estate of Vilema. But you can see that Stevenson has also written the note use page uh, plus eight. And <clears throat> it's these sorts of um, annotations that really intrigued me because what we see with many of the photographs um, are page references. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to uh, find what manuscripts, um, what manuscript pages could correspond to particular images and for the most part um, came up dry. <laughs> so uh, here are a few different uh, um, marginal notes and uh, you can see Stevenson's handwriting. Use page 17. Uh, at the bottom, he's made a correction where he has uh, crossed out the initial caption, which reads King Tebriomoa um, and slashed it out and replaced it with King and Queen of Butari Tari. Um, so he initially had misidentified uh, the subject of the photograph and then goes back. Uh, to correct himself. This is another one that he has shown particular interest in. And the note simply says, use anywhere. So we know that in the South Seas, that definitive um, work of anthropology history that he was working on was uh, intended to be illustrated quite heavily with photographs, with the photographs that Stevenson and his family were taking. And so these albums provide a kind of um, repository for us to, to get a sense of what sorts of images, what Stevenson was interested, what scenes he was interested in having illustrated, what topics um, or what characters or what locations he really wanted to emphasize um, using photography. Here we just have another example. Okay, and now um, moving from the albums to from the albums as archival physical objects, I want to give you a sampling of some photographs that are actually um, fairly good quality. For the most part, these are all photographs that come from the same album. Um, that is the album devoted to the cruise of the Janet Nickel. Uh, the cruise of the Janet Nickel is the third um, cruise that the Stevensons took um, while the estate of Vilema was being constructed. So I want to point out that um, Stevenson's photographs from the Pacific are certainly not uh, the earliest known examples uh, that depict, depict this region. Um, these are all images, of course, that were taken in the late 1880s and early 90s. And we know that photography arrived um, in the Pacific Islands as early as the late 1830s and early um, 1840s. We have um, photographs depicting specifically uh, Tahiti, um, from, from that early on. However, Stevenson's images um, do provide us with exceptional case studies uh, for uh, a broader analysis of colonial experience and settler experiences uh, in the Pacific because of the collection size, um, its wide range of subject matter, and because of Stevenson's own personal uh, close interactions with other settlers as well as with islanders, which allowed him to photograph or to, or which allowed 
his relatives to photograph in what was often a quasi uh, spontaneous and intimate fashion. Furthermore, in certain cases, Stevenson's collection provides us with some of the only, as far as I know, 19th century photographs of relatively undocumented islands. So we have um, hundreds of 19th century photographs that depict um, Hawaii, uh, Tahiti, the Marquesas, um, and of some of the other uh, Fiji, but there are uh, dozens of islands that were visited uh, by colonials, but that feature um, very rarely in larger archives. So some of Stevenson's photographs um, are very uh, remote and very small places. Uh, viewing Stevenson's photograph archive in concert with evolutionary and anthropological thinking of the period, uh, which was uh, focused greatly on uh, the disappearance, on the belief of the disappearance of indigenous peoples, we can see how Stevenson might have been wishing to document what was believed uh, to be vanishing cultures. Very often, however, the photographs themselves contradict uh, this widely held belief about the so-called uh, extinction of islanders as they appear as vibrant, enthusiastic, and vital photographic subjects. This image in particular that you can see is captioned, um, was captioned by Stevenson. Uh, this is what it would look like in the Janet Nichol album. And this captioned King of Manihiki with island judge on right hand in front of a beachcomber. Um, so what you're looking at here is a group uh, arranged in front of a big house with a grass roof on Manihiki Island. Um, the King of Manihiki stands in the center uh, wearing a black robe. Um, he has a star around his neck and a crown of pandanus leaves around his head. The island judge stands on his right hand, who has his hand on a child that stands between them. Uh, Tin Jack, an Euro a European merchant trader um, who uh, inspired the character of Tom yeah, in the novel The Wrecker, uh, is also visible there wearing, uh, wearing his hat, straw hat, crop trousers, and uh, is without any shoes. And a beachcomber sits on the sand in front of them wearing a big square woven uh, cape. Islanders can be seen in the background sitting under the shelter of the roof's house. Um, Stevenson was particularly intrigued like many other Victorians uh, by the figure by the figure of the beachcomber. Um, beachcombers by the time that Stevenson was visiting the Pacific had been uh, living on many uh, many Pacific islands since the early uh, 19th century um, and had become sort of fixtures of 19th century Pacific Island life. Um, and uh, Stevenson was quite interested in them as figures who inhabited um, ambiguous cultural spaces. Uh, so moving on to the next photograph here, um, the caption reads, Girl in sulfur box, sorry, girl in sulfur fuming box in Tokolo Islands, uh, the local method of curing a local itch. So here, what we're looking at is a, a young girl sitting inside of a wooden box on Atifu. Uh, Atifu is a uh, small island, part of a larger island chain of Tokolo. Uh, the box completely covers her up to the neck. The box itself is located inside of a uh, wooden hut with a pitched roof. Several boys uh, are 
surrounding the box as they're also, also inside of the hut. Um, the representation of disease and contamination in the Pacific has a very well established cultural and literary tradition uh, that uh, is not at all, was not at all limited um, to Stevenson. Specifically though, it is an issue that is sort of the issue of, of disease and, and um, the transmission of disease, which Stevenson deals with extensively in his nonfiction writing about the Pacific. Uh, specifically, uh, he was interested in leprosy as were many um, travelers in the 19th century. According to him, um, Europeans brought many diseases to the region. Of course, he was largely uh, correct, to which the local inhabitants um, had very little immune resistance. And um, many islands we know uh, were uh, very depopulated uh, due to it. Um, the local itch that's being referred to in this photograph here uh, is probably a type of uh, skin disease. Um, I don't know a great deal more about it <laughs> beyond that. This is the uh, second image which follows from the first. <clears throat> here we have the same girl uh, being represented. Uh, but now the box has been opened and it has presumably been opened uh, for the photographer. Um, now her bare interior becomes visible to us as she still stands within the sulfur fuming box. She wears the same unsmiling expression as in the previous one. Um, it's difficult not to look at this image, at this image, of course, and be reminded of how the camera can function as a tool that is able to peer inside hidden spaces, and that can, of course, expose bodies here quite literally. A photograph depicting a presumably rather private moment forces us to consider the context of its production. Has the photographer interrupted a vulnerable private moment? Um, has the photograph subject uh, given permission to the photographer? Does the colonial camera here replicate or expose the harm caused by the disease? What are the circumstances surrounding the making of this image? This is not the only photograph in the collection, in the Stevenson collection, um, that uh, encourage us to ask uh, such questions. <clears throat> the next couple of photographs um, depict the uh, the deck of the J Janet Nickel. Now, the Janet Nickel was a trading vessel. Uh, Stevenson and his wife Fanny, um, as well as his stepson Lloyd Osborne, um, got sort of got special permission to travel on this trading vessel. Um, they weren't really told beforehand where the Janet Nickel um, would travel. They just knew that it was um, going to be focusing on a per particular uh, trajectory around what corresponds loosely as Micronesia. And one of the things that the Janet Nickel was predominantly occupied in doing was stopping at specific islands and um, dropping off uh, cargo or picking up cargo. And in the next couple of photographs, what we can see is the uh, bringing of pearl shell or mother of pearl um, on to the Janet Nickel. The Janet Nickel was a New Zealand uh, yes, a New Zealand trading ship. And what we have here uh, depicted in this image specifically are young islanders. These are all boys who would swim out to the trading vessel. Uh, they would swim out or sort of wade out carrying 
um, cargo uh, and would deliver it to the Janet Nickel. So they're helping to load the cargo onto the trading vessel. Here we have another image uh, in the series entitled Penryn Stowing Pearl Shell. Um, Penryn was uh, of, of interest to Stevenson, um, well, because of the pearl shell, he was quite interested in diving, um, in the practice of diving for pearl um, and the importance of pearl shell as a commodity um, that circulated around the Pacific. Penryn was also of interest because it had a leper colony. So the most famous leper colony um, in the Pacific and certainly one of the sort of most prominent leper colonies in the world um, is on the island of Molokai uh, on the island chain of Hawaii, which Stevenson um, visited. He visited a, the leper colony there. Penryn also um, had an, uh, has had a little islet um, that was kept aside as a leper colony. And again, because of his interest in uh, leprosy and the transmission of diseases around the different islands, uh, specifically how, do, how did diseases um, jump from island to island, uh, Penryn proved to be uh, of interest for multiple reasons, not only the trading of pearl shell, but also the uh, trading of diseases. So this is my uh, final image. It's obviously not a photograph. Um, this is an image from uh, a Victorian, um, I think an Australian newspaper depicting, uh, depicting Stevenson amongst uh, Samoans. Stevenson's life in the Pacific from 1888 until his death in 1894 exerted and still continues to exert a powerful fascination on the late Victorian literary public. As he continued writing historical novels about Scotland from Samoa, he was perceived as being a romantic exile yearning for his native homeland. The caption to this illustration reads, and it's a, a long caption, it reads, uh, Robert Louis, the first of Samoa. The latest Australian papers leave no room for doubt that by general consent, Mr. Stevenson is now regarded as the first citizen of Samoa. And if events should develop in the direction of the choice of a ruler by the popular will, the author of Treasure Island would assuredly head the poll." End quote. Um, there's a lot to, that one could say about this quote, um, namely, uh, <laughs> Um, the reference to Stevenson as the, quote, first citizen of Samoa. Um, he, this may give the impression that he was the only non-Samoan inhabitant on the islands of Samoa. Um, that is very far from the truth. Uh, he may have been one of the most famous, but he was certainly not uh, the most important important uh, by a long shot in terms of um, in terms of politics and diplomacy. The reference to the events uh, that might lead to a ruler by the popular will is also uh, somewhat misleading. It is probably a reference to the civil wars that were uh, occurring while Stevenson uh, was a settler in Samoa. We know that Stevenson involved himself to certain or to varying degrees in Samoan politics, um, but that he would become the ruler of Samoa um, 
is uh, extremely unlikely uh, and sort of will definitely kind of glosses over uh, how Samoans uh, ruled themselves and were ruled um, by the colonial powers in the 1880s and 90s. So certainly Stevenson was a celebrity, um, celebrity living on the estate of Vailima uh, in Samoa. Um, we know of the, the affinities he had with certain uh, Samoan leaders, but that he would become the ruler of Samoa um, is, uh, <laughs> uh, is, is far from, um, I think, what would have ever occurred or what Steven, Stevenson himself would have desired. Um, now, what the image does do uh, is illustrate the fact that Stevenson's residence in Samoa provoked enormous public interest uh, in Britain, in the United States, in Europe, in Australia. The appetite for news about his exotic life, his house, his domestic relationships, led to the formation of the author that could, unlike his political involvement and much of his literary work, be reconciled with what the metropolitan public liked best about the Stevenson that was viewed as a romantic, romantic exile. So in other words, uh, there were two, and I'm, I'm certainly not the, the first person to point this out. In a sense, there were two different Stevensons while Stevenson was in the Pacific. There was the Stevenson who was the uh, intrepid traveler uh, who was living in far flung uh, exotic locations. And then there was the Stevenson who was interested in the, uh, in the history and the cultures uh, in the colonial entanglements uh, that were occurring at the end of the 19th century. Um, and that sort of more political Stevenson um, was not necessarily the Stevenson that his readers were keen uh, or interested in knowing about or learning about. This illustration, the one that you're looking at now, encapsulates the fantasy of controlled and unthreatening foreignness with which the author became associated with. Um, in other words, it very succinctly reduces the eccentric, literally eccentric and oftentimes uh, strange author who was unpredictable and unfashionable in his politics and intellectual whims. Um, so that, that, that concludes my presentation. Hello? Hello. <laughs> Thanks, <Fred. laughs> <Unmute> myself. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, wow, it was so interesting to look at those, um, those photographs uh, from so long ago. Um, yeah, like the sulfur box. Um, interesting. Um, well, so now, um, thank you so much. Let's open it up for um, discussion, for questions. Um, you can send questions to me in the chat and I can pass them along, or you can um, raise your hand or write down that you want to ask something in person and then we'll um, unmute you. So, um, yes, does anyone have any anything to talk about that they want to um, ask, uh, ask about? Oh, I need my oh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, this is from Vanessa. Did Robert Louis Stevenson serialize his fiction in the periodical press? Uh, his his specific fiction or Vanessa, do you yeah? Um, yeah. Hi, oh. Carla. Sorry. Oh, hi, Vanessa. Um, yep. How are you? Thanks for this great talk. Um, I'm just jumping in because I was super interested to learn from you.
that he had kind of uh, chopped up and sold, you know, to the periodical press this this project in process, um, if I've understood you correctly. And and I just wondered, like, was this his first foray into kind of the serialization of, of book projects or I should know this, but I can't remember if he was also serializing his his fiction, generally speaking. Uh, uh, yes, he was. And so the 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 in the South Seas um, uh, was well, he was commissioned to write letters. He was commissioned to write letters uh, for the New York Sun, which would then uh, appear as well in the New York Sun and in black and white in London. Um, but the letters that he, so they were supposed to be like, you know, letters from a traveler type of thing where he would, you know, recount encounters with natives on islands. Um, uh, but what he was sending back were, um, were basically kind of like anthropological accounts of what he was, of what he was witnessing. And because he was while he had been paid for a certain number of these letters, what he actually was more interested in doing was writing a book. So his idea, so the letters were very, very poorly received and then canceled. Um, so that, that was a sort of fiasco and, and disaster financially. Um, <laughs> but then his idea was to take the letters and cobble them together to make a book. Um, but letters don't necessarily translate very well into chapters and into books. Um, and he continued trying to piece it all together and chopping it up in, into bits. And, but it never really worked out. Um, and it was only posthumously that his editor, Sidney Colvin, took what he considered to be the more successful accounts, the more, you know, exciting ones, um, more complete ones, and put together in the South Seas. Um, but yes, he was also writing fiction, short stories and short novels from the Pacific, um, and those did appear uh, in serial form. That's great. Thanks so much, Carla. You're welcome. Carla, I have, um, I have two questions here that kind of go together, so I'm going to, to ask them um, at the same time. So one is from uh, Jennifer Ganson, and she's curious about um, his marriage and stepchildren. And the second one is from Kala, uh, who was wondering, would the remuneration for the serialization of his work provided him with significant income? And would his family have benefited from this after his death? Yeah. Um... Yeah, so uh, Stevenson's, uh, Stevenson's marriage and uh, domestic life is, is quite, um, quite intriguing and I, and I think would make uh, for, a great, uh, <laughs> for a great movie. Um, so Stevenson was married to a woman named um, Fanny Vandergrift, later Fanny Vandergrift Stevenson. Uh, she was from... Um, she was American. Uh, she was 10 years older than Stevenson. They met um, in, in France in an artist's colony. And uh, Fanny, at the time of their meeting, was not yet divorced from her first husband, with whom she had had uh, two children, um, a girl named uh, Isabel and a son named Lloyd. Uh, there was another child that the, that child had uh, this had uh, died. So by the time, uh, so when Stevenson married Fanny, um, he was marrying a woman with two young-ish children. Lloyd might have been, uh, I, I could be wrong, between the age of six and nine, I think. Treasure Island uh, is dedicated to Lloyd, uh, Lloyd Osborne, Samuel Lloyd Osborne. Um, and by the time that, uh, that they went to the Pacifics, uh, to the Pacific, Stevenson was with Fanny and Lloyd. They left with also his mother, uh, who was by then a widow. Lloyd was 19. 
when they got to Hawaii, they met up with Isabel, who by this point was married to a Californian artist who had also moved to Hawaii. Um, <laughs> it gets very convoluted. Uh, the whole family kind of made found its way to Samoa. And when uh, they settled, there was Stevenson, his wife Fanny, stepson um, Lloyd, uh, Isabel, her husband, um, Joe. Uh, Joe was the real sort of talented photographer. Most of the, a lot of the photographs were probably taken by Joe. Um, and, uh, and Joe and Isabel's son, Austin, Austin Strong, who, and then there was a divorce. Joe probably had an affair with a Samoan woman and Stevenson uh, kicked him out of the house and made it possible for Isabel uh, to divorce Joe. And Stevenson adopted Isabel's son, Austin. So would be kind of his step grandson. Stevenson and Fanny never had any children of their own. Um, in terms of, so I hope that sort of answers a little bit about the, the domestic situation, um, which admittedly can get a little bit convoluted. Um, in terms of the income, so yes, so Stevenson died, of course, relatively well, young. He was 44. Uh, he died suddenly, uh, probably of a cerebral hemorrhage. Um, he was, the story goes, making making salad or something in the kitchen and turned to Fanny and said, do I look funny and held his head and a few hours later um, had died. Uh, he was buried um, just uh, on a little hilltop looking over Vailima on Mount Vaya um, and his, his tomb is there and can be visited. The Vailima estate is now a museum dedicated to Stevenson. Um, all of his possessions and uh, his income went to his wife, Fanny. Fanny and Isabel and Lloyd stayed on at Vilema for a little while longer. Uh, Fanny returned to California with Isabel, went to Santa Barbara. And when Fanny died in 1914, uh, everything went to Isabel and Lloyd, uh, Isabel auctioned off the majority of the manuscripts and possessions uh, at uh, an auction in New York City in 1914, around that point, I think. And that was the sort of first major, major sale um, of, Steven of Stevenson's um, manuscripts. So, um, uh, probably the largest collection went to Yale University to the Beinecke Rare uh, Book Library, but things got, that's when things got really scattered. Um, and I, I believe that Fanny then, after her husband's death, um, yes, lived off of the, the estate. Great, I hope that answers uh, those questions. Um, I just sent you a few that I didn't want to um, leave them in the chat here, but we have uh, one from Alora. When we think of, uh, I don't know if you can see it, I'll read it out loud though. Uh, when we think of photographs within the Victorian era, does the marginalia help to better understand the photographs which are difficult to see? Which are difficult to see. Um, Oh, uh, I, I, I'm assuming difficult to see in the sense of the quality of the photographs. I'm, I'm interpreting that, yeah. Um, well, certainly in, in the case of, um, of, of Stevenson's collection, I would say yes. So the, the photographs that I showed, the, the ones that appear to be very clear and better quality. Those, um, those don't have a great deal of 
marginalia. Those are the ones that were, I think, predominantly taken uh, by Joe Strong, uh, Stevenson's uh, uh, son-in-law, <laughs> Stevenson's step-son-in-law, who was a professional photographer. Those were taken using um, a taken using using flash. So the quality is obviously very good. The uh, the, uh, the photographs from the other album that I began by showing you um, are examples of very, very difficult ones to see. They have deteriorated a great deal. Um, and so in that case, yes, the marginalia um, has helped me to identify uh, what I'm looking at. Um, uh, in terms of the content of the photographs. And in some cases we can, sorry, the baby is crying. <laughs> uh, and in some cases uh, we can find parallels between the marginalia and Stevenson's own writing, right? So then it becomes, becomes really interesting because we have you know, we have his letters, we have uh, diary records, and we have uh, visual illustrations plus marginalia, and all of these different pieces can be put together in order to get a much clearer picture, if you will, of what is being discussed and what's going on. Have the is over. <laughs> I have three questions that I think are like the same, uh, very similar. So uh, maybe you can lump them all together. Um, from Rose, uh, Rosaline, Sheila, um, do you think he had a colonial superior attitude? And how did the rulers of Samoa react to uh, his involvement in their politics? Uh, was the first part of the question, did he have a colonial attitude? Yeah. Um, yeah, so so this is a big, uh, this is a, a large topic. And um, and the, uh, well, well, yes, yes, of course he had a colonial attitude because uh, Sheila is my mother-in-law. So, you know, she might want to see her, her grandchild right now. Um, so yes, he had a colonial attitude because um, he was in the Pacific with with some preconceived notions about um, hierarchies in terms of cultures and ethnicities. Um, now, did those preconceptions change over time? Um, you know, did they improve? Did they get worse? Um, in some, and again, the answer is sort of yes and no. Um, I think my interpretation is that Stevenson's attitudes were for a 19th century British traveler, fairly enlightened, if you will. Um, were there still prejudices? Undoubtedly, yes. Um, <laughs> undoubtedly, yes. Um, what did Samoans think about Stevenson's involvement um, is a difficult question to answer because we don't have, as far as I know, a great deal of evidence um, from Samoans themselves. Now, that is not to say that Samoans uh, were not writing and communicating about the politics that were going on um, in their islands. They were very much so with say uh, other islanders. So for instance, um, uh, in the Hawaiian Na National Archives, for instance, we have hundreds and hundreds of written documentation 
uh, written in Hawaiian and in Samoan um, that has partially been tra translated into English between Hawaiians and Samoans. And they are actively discussing the uh, colonial intrusions uh, and politics into their kingdoms. So uh, was Stevenson and were other Americans and Europeans uh, sort of aware of those discussions? I don't, I don't think they would have necessarily been aware of the extent um, of how much inter-island um, communication was going on. Um, we know, you know, that Stevenson befriended certain Samoan faction leaders um, and they were, and some of them, uh, you know, were probably quite pleased to have a European sort of celebrity backing them up. Um, I don't think, you know, I mean, these, I, don't, I don't think they were like overawed by him. Um, and they certainly didn't view him as, you know, a savior to their cause, but um, some of them would have been able to use him uh, sort of in a strategic fashion uh, to gain, you know, entry into other European circles. The political situation in Samoa was quite complicated in terms of colonial politics because there were Americans, Germans, and British involved, um, as well as Samoans, and as well as the Hawaiian kingdom that also had its own uh, agenda in Samoa. So it gets quite complicated. Um, and if we only look at the situation from a point of view of Stevenson, we get a, a very limited perspective um, on uh, on that part of the world and on uh, on Samoan politics. And it would appear if we only look at what Stevenson had to say that Stevenson plays a very important role. <laughs> um, he he doesn't really, um, but of course his, his name was recognizable. Um, so I hope that helps to answer somebody's question somewhat. Um, now, Carla, we have a few questions coming in. Are you, um, do you need to attend to your, your baby? Oh, oh no, I, there's, there, her father is attending to her. Okay. <laughs> okay. She, she's, the baby is not just, you know, hasn't been left by, by No, I know. I, I was thinking of that. I wasn't sure if like she wanted you or something. So. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I will ask these last three uh, questions. Um, one is uh, the, the sketch that we're looking at uh, with the dancing maidens. It's uh, very misleading and insulting. Would he have ever seen it? Uh, that's a that's a really good really good question. Um, I'm trying um, I'm trying to th think if I remember. Okay. Uh, well, this this must be before uh, before he died. Um, would he have seen it? Well, it's very possible that he would have seen it. Um, uh, sorry, I'm a little bit distracted. It's very possible that he would have seen it, and I think that he would. So should would would I should I comment on what I think he would have thought of it? Maybe. Yeah. yeah well. Uh, I think he he would have probably found it uh, pretty pretty silly. Um, he would have immediately recognized that the clothing is a uh, strange mishmash of uh, Samoan dress. So, so the, the, the men who are carrying Stevenson, of course, Samoans never carried Stevenson like that, um, are wearing around their waists what are called lava lavas, um, and they are still worn today in Samoa, but they normally, the men would be 
bare chested. They wouldn't be wearing these sort of um, sort of Grecian looking tunics. Um, Samoan women uh, do not wear uh, sort of, again, kind of Grecian or Romanized um, dresses of that of that sort. So he, he would have recognized that as being wrong. Um, and I think the carrying, um, I, I would like to think that Stevenson would have found that very ridiculous. Um, yeah, and, 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 and insulting. And I don't know what the women are supposed to be doing. They're sort of dancing. Again, uh, Stevenson writes a lot about different Pacific Island uh, dance and um, and none of these gestures um, are recognizably uh, Samoan dance, uh, which is sort of highly choreographed and um, and this kind of parading him down the street. I don't think he would have uh, appreciated very much. Did, did he learn to speak? Uh, Samoan? Uh, to an extent, yes. So he did take Samoan uh, language classes with um, with British missionaries who uh, who were living in uh, in Samoa, who had been there for decades. Um, and he, so he did uh, he did probably have a sort of rudimentary speaking ability. Uh, I think he was also very much interested in being able to uh, read and write some Samoan. Um, one of his short stories written from Samoa, which in English is called The Bottle Imp, uh, was initially uh, published before being published in English, was published in Samoan and was first published in a Samoan newspaper for Samoans. Uh, Samoans, like Hawaiians, like a lot of Pacific Islanders by the end of the 19th century were literate. Um, and Stevenson wanted, uh, wanted to publish something for uh, the Samoan reading public. Now he didn't translate his writing into Samoan, that was done uh, by a missionary. Um, but there do still exist in his notebooks vocabulary sheets um, from his from his lessons where he has written out um, you know English English words and then right next to them uh, the Samoan ones. And uh, in the Yale Library, uh, you can they they still have his um, uh, dictionary, Samoan English dictionary, which existed, uh, which had been, which had been put together in the 1840s by a British missionary, um, and is still the basis of today's English Samoan dictionary. And so Stevenson had one, and it still exists, and it has some of his annotations in it. Well, uh, that question was from uh, Rosalind. Um, before I ask uh, this final question, um, I have a quick, I, I think it might be a quick, do we, uh, a question from uh, Mafalda. Do we keep any original photographic plates uh, by, um, by him or only print? Um, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, I, so I, I'm fairly certain that there are photographic plates that are associated with, uh, with Stevenson, but not necessarily, but I am not sure if they are of his time in the Pacific. Um, so I actually cannot, I, I have not seen them. Um, and, and so I can't actually answer that question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>
I know that there are plates of his that represent other parts of his life, but I I don't know if they're the time in the Pacific. Okay, last question. It's a big one. When did you become interested in the works and the life of Robert Louis Stevenson? Oh, um, yeah, that's probably the easiest question to answer. Um, and it's not a very interesting answer, unfortunately. Um, it was uh, while I was uh, working on my MA at the University of Toronto, uh, I took a seminar on Victorian travel writing. And um, some of the assigned reading um, was not in the South Seas, but was his Pacific fiction, um, uh, his collection of short stories. And I wrote my final essay on them. And all what I what I remember, I don't remember the source, but I remember I was reading an article or a book and there was a footnote. And the footnote referenced something about the, the photography or the photographs. And that really uh, intrigued me. I thought, oh, wouldn't it be, I, I would like to, to see those photographs. Um, and I didn't know anything about Victorian photography at that time and didn't have really an interest in it. And I tried to find out more about the photographs, but there was very little uh, information out there. And um, when it came time to start um, my, my PhD, I thought, well, um, I would like to know more about those photographs. Um, I would like to be able to go see them if they exist. I would, uh, uh, yeah, I, I had a lot of questions at that point, and it seemed to me to be very mysterious that there wasn't a lot of information, a great deal of information about them. Um, and then it sort of went <laughs> went from there. It kind of opened a bit of a can of worms, but here we, here we are. Wow. What one little thing can do. Yes. <laughs> um, well, that's... Uh, that's it for the questions that I have here in the chat. Um, unless anyone has anything um, for, else for you. Um, I just want to thank you so much for, for doing this for us, uh, Carla, and um, for sharing your expertise and all these great uh, images with us. Um, it was fascinating. And um, uh, if you all um, are still with us and had to maybe leave, um, the, the conversation was recorded and so will be available on our YouTube uh, channel uh, later on. And um, you can go back and, and take notes if you want. Um, oh, I don't know if you're reading any of this in the chat. I, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Well, uh, thank you everybody for, for coming. Uh, you're, you're, oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, it's kind of kind of wild having all this these little chat things. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of interest. That's really good. Uh, uh, fantastic. And uh, so, thank you so much. And um, for everyone else, it's this is the end of the talk. So um, you may leave. Um, if you have more questions uh, for uh, Dr. Manfredi, then um, maybe just pop them in the chat there and we can um, trail out. But otherwise, uh, this is the end and thank you so much. Oh, hello oh. from Scotland, hello from France. Amazing. Oh, wow. In, inter truly international audience here. Uh, the engagement has been amazing. So thank you so much um, for preparing this talk for us today. <laughs>